Hey, in case you haven't already heard, tonight I will be doing something completely different. That sense of mystery, very strong sense of story, and you can't underestimate how powerful capturing moments like this can be. The smoke, the anxiety on their faces, I can just hear them cheering. So yeah, with some of the photos, I definitely feel like you've communicated the atmosphere. I'm gonna be looking at travel documentary work from other photographers, and I'll be offering tips, suggestions, advice on how they can improve their photography, their storytelling, whether through single images or through a series of photographs. So yeah, there will be a lot to learn in this video. By the way, I'm making this video in the kitchen of the house which we're renting during this crisis. It's late at night, very quiet and peaceful, probably the only time that I could make this video. So in case you're wondering why things look a little different and dark, well, that's why. Now, I went through far more submissions than I expected, which is kind of awesome to have a really great response, but it was very difficult to narrow it down to nine. I will spread them over three episodes just so that I can give a sufficient amount of time to every participant. All of the participants will be receiving access, free access to my travel photography course, though it's become clear that some of you already have this course. This is the same course that I talk about through all of my videos, and the same course that's currently discounted by 70% due to this little situation that we're all in. I want to give more people something to learn, something to distract themselves with. The participants will also get all of my eBooks. And these are all over the place, so they're quite hard to get a hold of, but this is just a way for me to say thank you very much for participating. One important little note. The reason that I chose the portfolios that I chose is because they represent a wide range, a variety of different types of travel documentary photography and different approaches too. So there will be something for everybody to learn in these videos. Anyway, without any further ado, let's begin. So the first participant is Ferdinando Jeremica. I really hope that I said that right. He is from Rome, Italy. Uh, and he sent me his photos via Instagram. His Instagram handle, if you want to follow him, is Chasing Beauty Photography. Okay, so the reason why I chose Ferdinando's portfolio is because I think from the photographs, from all the places that he's been to, it's quite clear that we share the same love, the same passion for exploring as much of the world as possible, for photographing its amazing, its beautiful cultures and traditions. And I know that very many of us share this love, this passion. Uh, Ferdinando's portfolio is huge. There are almost 1,000 photographs just on the Instagram account. I think there are probably more on his website and he's been almost everywhere. So there is absolutely no way that I can uh, look through all of the photographs, but there are some in particular that I think will be very, very useful for the audience to have a look at. And I think that there are some very interesting lessons that uh, we can all take away. Now, another important reason that I chose Ferdinando's portfolio is because of the request that he had. Now, if you were one of the people who submitted their portfolio for review, you would have noticed that there was a section in the form which said, what do you want me to focus on? So let's have a look at what Ferdinando wrote. Hello, Mitchell. Despite being kind of proud of the way I express myself through my photography, I feel like there's something still missing in it, but I'm not able to clearly identify what it is. I would love to know your opinion about this doubt of mine. And since I truly loved your travel photography course, well, thank you very much, I would like to hear from your voice if there's something particular, especially regarding storytelling skills that you think I definitely should improve. All right, so I do think that there are definitely a few things. Like I said, an interesting request, an interesting question. So many very solid photographs, photographs that could be the envy of, of many people, yet something is missing. What is missing? Well, I think that what's missing, we could get a hint to that in the uh, name of the Instagram account, Chasing Beauty Photography. I often raise this question, does a photograph have to be beautiful, to have impact, to be engaging, to be powerful? 
And the fact is the beautiful postcard-like images, uh, over time, they actually become quite predictable, uh, a little bit boring, and as a result, they actually lose their impact versus some other types of photographs. Uh, let me just get to the two photographs which I think can illustrate my point rather well. It's these two here. And as you can see, this one has more likes, far more comments. This one, less likes, less comments. However, well, let me explain. This photograph to me is an example of a postcard-like photograph. It is beautiful. There are great colors. The subject is great. This sadhu, this holy man that uh, you find them in India and Nepal. Textures, quite nice light. But this photo, it poses no questions. What you see is pretty much what you get. Like I said, it's nice, it's postcard-like, but if Ferdinando, you're looking for that edge, then these types of photographs, I don't think that they have that edge. And if you are a traveler, if you've been to these countries, if you've seen maybe five of these kinds of photographs, then it's a bit like, okay, great, I get it. There's nothing really in it that engages you and encourages you to keep looking at it and looking for some sort of a story. Now, this image. Right away, I can say that it's not quite as well composed. However, this image really has a few things going for it. Uh, the obvious thing is that this guy, uh, also a holy man, uh, smoking his pipe, the chillum. He's got this mad look in his eyes, so there's this gesture. It, it is instantly more dynamic. But what I really love here, what captivates me here, and what makes me ask questions, it's these gestures, you know, the, the hands of these two men. Why are they like this? Is it because they're cold? Is it because they're so desperate, so anxious to, to have their turn at smoking the chillum? Or is it both? Uh, is it because that once they smoke it, they will get warm? Instantly, there are questions that enter my mind when I look at this photograph. It's not as pretty, doesn't have the same postcard feel to it, but it's infinitely more engaging, partly because of visual cues. Visual cues are something that I've talked about numerous times. Visual cues are signals to our brains, to our senses. Uh, they can make us feel a certain way, they can evoke certain memories. So with these sadhus and their gesture, you know, with their arms like this, uh, close to their body, that to me signals that they're cold and that sort of triggers different memories and really makes me feel this photograph rather than only see it. I'll talk more about visual cues and I'll give more examples as we continue. Now there are different levels of visual cues, so you could say that this man's costume, his sort of whole look is a visual cue to an exotic culture, but some visual cues are more universally understandable and just more powerful than others. So for example, Ferdinando does have many photographs which do have more powerful kinds of visual cues. Like here for example, you have the fire, you have the people with their hands over the fire and that instantly uh, just speaks to your senses and you start to experience the photograph almost on a physiological level. Now, Ferdinando also asked about the storytelling aspect and here's what I have to say about that. You can tell a story in different ways. You can do it in a very straightforward way. Uh, all the information is there, all the details are there, but the story is just not very engaging, not very captivating. Or you can tell a story in a way which is very eloquent and you maybe don't tell everything right away. You hide some details, little by little you reveal parts of the story and it becomes infinitely more engaging and more interesting. And I just want to demonstrate with a couple of other images. So here, this in my opinion is a way of telling a story in a very straightforward way. It's in Allahabad, India, so let's say I went to Allahabad, India. I saw a beautiful child in a beige dress. She was smiling. She stood against a brick wall with peeling blue paint. That's it, that's the story. But of course, there is another way of telling a story. So this is the first image that came up that I think demonstrates it very well. This one here. So this is how this story could be told. In a dimly lit smoky room, I only saw half of the bearded man's face. The other half was hidden in the darkness. He was decorated with traditional ornaments, and while he was looking down, 
I couldn't imagine what he was thinking of. It seemed to be something intense. So a very different way of telling a story. There are questions raised, there's a sense of mystery. I mean, I wanna know, why is this man in a dimly lit, smoky room? What is the rest of the room? I'm not given that information. I can only see half of his face. And in this case, I see hints of his costume. He's looking down, what is he thinking about? I have so many questions that are unanswered. The photograph doesn't give all the answers, but it provokes me to think about them. And I think that this way of storytelling is just so much more engaging and captivating. So Ferdinando, you do have these sorts of images. Uh, I don't know if you're capturing them consciously or subconsciously just through your instincts, but you do have them. And at the same time, you have a lot of these postcard-like photographs, which I have mentioned are the envy of, of many, partly because very few people have been to all the places that you've been to, and even fewer are able to capture the photographs on the level of postcards. And please don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that the postcard images are bad, I'm just, I'm just saying all of this in relation to what you've asked, because you mentioned that you feel that something is missing that a lot of the images, they don't have that edge. Now, I wanna to get to some landscape photos because I think that they can demonstrate another point that I wanna make. Here are some landscapes, but these are not the ones that I had in mind. I had a look at some of the other ones. Many beautiful photographs. I'll just keep scrolling. And this is the group of images that I wanna talk about. Firstly, I would like to touch on those which I think are less impressive. So, something like this. Nice, bright, kind of flat, beautiful, undoubtedly, but what you see is pretty much what you get. Same thing here, and for most part in something like this too, though this cloud is somewhat unusual and that kind of gives it an extra element of interest that puts this photo in a slightly different category. But let me get back to these photographs here taken in the dark. I think it's this image that I had a look at before, and it reminds me of one thing. Through our photographs, we can tell stories, we can tell the stories in different ways, or the photographs could be the equivalent to a poem. So in this photo here, we have this dark sky full of stars, the whole universe is above us, and the earth is in darkness. Now, I'm not gonna attempt to recite a poem, I'm really bad at writing poetry, but visually to me, this has the ingredients to be a poem. It doesn't necessarily make sense in terms of a narrative, like yeah, it's a, it's a dark starry sky, but there is so much mystery to it. There's so much flexibility as to what this can be. You can look at this photograph in so many different ways. It is beautiful, but it could be seen as symbolic. Light and darkness, infinity of the universe, all sorts of things come to mind. Most importantly, this photo engages my imagination. I wanna transport myself up into the sky. I want to explore the dark earth. And so I'm very involved and so are my senses. Now let's have a look at some more of your landscape photos. I've already talked about some of these, but I just wanna draw your attention very quickly to, to this one. I think it's in a different category because of this interplay of shadow and light. Again, it's that whole mystery, the battle between light and dark. It's also sunrise or sunset, which is very evocative. So the mind can kind of invent various storylines and details uh, to make this photograph more interesting. Same thing goes for this one. There's the visual cue of the fog, again, setting or rising sun. It's a slightly different category uh, to a photograph like this one. Not to say that this photograph doesn't serve a purpose. I'd say that if I'm doing a photo story, or something like that, this photograph definitely has a place there. But as a standalone image, it's very beautiful, but I just feel it's not as engaging as some of the ones that I just mentioned. Now there's one image that you have that I like in particular, and it's this one. It's called Running Up the Hill, Escaping the Storm. Well, it's beautiful, like the others, but what I think is really special about it are those visual cues that I keep talking about, that sense of mystery, very strong sense of story. This could be a poem. Let me explain why. So the whole thing about visual cues, we have a few very strong ones here. The stormy sky, the wet 
road, which I can almost feel the wetness of that road getting sprinkled by the water. The car lights, which suggest that in this case, it's most likely late afternoon. So all of these things, they just instantly trigger memories and they work on my senses. Looking at this, my imagination just goes wild, you know. After reading uh, the title, I'm thinking, where exactly is this car escaping to? Where have they been? Where is this? What was the day like? Did they not expect the storm? You know, did it come suddenly? What waits ahead? Are they going to escape it? So the photograph is kind of simple, but it is kind of powerful on many different levels. So I'm gonna start to wrap it up here. Ferdinando, you have a great, vast collection of photographs, all sorts of images. In my opinion, some already have that edge, that something extra special that you're looking for, that strong sense of story. There's no doubt about that. I don't know if you are recognizing that, but it, it is definitely there in some of the photographs. And I'm just showing some of the ones which I also think are strong on different levels right now. So I would like you to set a challenge for yourself. I'm sure that you know that you can create these kinds of postcard-like photographs in your sleep. That's already something that you have proven to yourself. And I don't know, maybe that's no longer quite as interesting for you. So why don't you look for photos which will allow you to tell stories in a more eloquent, less straightforward kind of way with a sense of mystery, uh, photos that will raise questions and really engage the viewer's imagination, like some of these photos that I talked about. And then in those situations where there's no clear story as such, why not look at photographs as poems? Something evocative that just speaks directly to the senses, can have multiple meanings and again very importantly really engages the viewer so yeah thank you very much for putting yourself and your work out there i hope it all makes sense to you and to the viewers if you have any questions that's what the comment section is for let's move to the next portfolio now it is from bulgaria from valeri postarov his website is postarov.net and uh, his Instagram is valeri.postarov. Before I get to the photos, I have to admit that this is one of my favorite portfolios from all of the submissions. And I, I have to say one thing. When I say critique, the word critique, portfolio, photo critique, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, it's something negative or that I'm trying to pick the work apart or that I am going to criticize it. Critique means looking at the work in a critical manner analyzing what works, what doesn't work as well. But in this particular case, uh, I will be looking a lot at what works because I think that by doing that, we can learn a lot from Valeri's photographs. All right, let's get right to the photos. And while I'm showing you the photos, I want to quickly summarize what Valeri wrote about his project. He started in 2007. And the idea was to document the last traditional rural communities in a region called the Rodobe Mountains. In the photos you are seeing, he's been capturing the changing and the gradually vanishing culture and a way of life. Valeri seems to be on a mission. He says that when he started the project, the villages would have from 350 to 400 people living in them. And now most are empty. The whole area of the Rodope Mountains is quite large. For centuries, it was full of lively villages and hamlets, and it was a stronghold of trade and tradition. Now, these mountains are 95% depopulated, and it's the story of much of the world. The young leave the countryside and the villages are left there forgotten. As Valeri says, the survivors have to brave solitude and the elements. And the last man standing in the Rodope Mountains is a proud epitome of the human race. And that's the name of the project, The Last Man Standing in the Rodope Mountains. Man, I love the work. I appreciate the idea behind it. I've actually been to Bulgaria a few times and somehow I've never visited these areas. I've never seen them like you have. So it's really fascinating to me. Now, I want to read through your email and touch on the points that you raise, uh, the questions that you ask, because I think they're very interesting and they're very important for some other people who are also working on long-term projects, especially people who are working on projects similar to your one. Now, here's what Valeri wrote. 
I'm going to start reading and I'll very quickly get to his wonderful photographs. I have submitted this project to some book publishers, but most of them consider that such a book would be difficult to sell internationally. I am now starting to wonder if this kind of local and unpopular project subject could have just a local importance, if any. Or maybe I just failed to make it interesting to the wider international audience, unaware of the local culture and problems. I would appreciate if you could share your opinion on this matter. When and how a local culture could be represented in such a way in order to become of global interest? Should we, as photographers in this globalized century, represent only extraordinary and astonishing subjects and ignore the ordinary people and their lifestyle? Should we, or could we, in the post-COVID-19 world, travel to the most isolated places in order to find this exact sense of uniqueness? Or must we search for it near us? So some pretty deep stuff. This email, the questions, they do make a lot of sense when we look at your work. And I will get to them, but just before that, I do want to show the audience more of your images, and I want to explain why I think your project is quite special. Then I also do have a couple of tips slash ideas about your work. One thing that pretty much all of Valeri's photos have in common is that from the very beginning, they have a strong sense of story. Also, for most part, Valeri keeps it pretty simple, but he's very effective. Because there is no confusion what any given photo is about. He captures tender, sometimes beautiful, human moments. And you can't underestimate how powerful capturing moments like this can be, even in portraits which often tend to be more static. Valeri does also photograph these amazing characters and, and their faces, they tell so many stories. One thing that I think is important is that Valeri doesn't use some special techniques or artificial lights to light the images in a very dramatic way. Sometimes the people that do that, they do it for particular stylizing. Some of them don't really know why they're doing it. And so as a result, those kinds of images look very gimmicky. That's not the case here. He just lets these characters and these faces speak for themselves. To an untrained eye, it might seem like photos like these are just about the character, that there's not much else to it, but there are actually many things involved. As Valeri mentioned, he's been to over 700 villages. And I know from this kind of work myself that it's all about searching. You talk to one person, to another, then you go from one place to the next and to the next until you finally find those characters. And when you do find them, you still have to have the presence of mind to then create a photo around them that works. You've got to make any person comfortable and trusting enough to be in your photo. And you, as a photographer, have to quickly figure out how to compose your shot to tell their story in the most effective manner that is possible in the circumstances. Like this photo, this amazing man-child, man-boy's face. He's probably been through so much. And again, it's a simple photograph, but it works. I wonder if he was walking somewhere and everything sort of aligned naturally and Valeri simply asked him to pause or if he asked this boy to stand here in this particular place with the horse harness with the carriage in the far background and his mom or family member in the background and to the side. As a documentary photographer, you have to make these decisions really quickly. Things are aligned favorably for a very limited amount of time. And once the scene is disrupted, that's it. You're never getting it back quite the same way ever again. Also love how Valeri tells these double stories sometimes. This boy lost in his thoughts in the foreground and then the men in the background being manly and chopping wood. Or a similar idea of this grandfather waiting for a bus, perhaps lost in his thoughts as well, while his grandson is just being a child in the background and playing. So Valeri, most of your work, uh, your specialty, you could say at least in regards to this project, are environmental portraits. But now I want to talk about some photos that are different to those that are not environmental portraits. This image here, I love these kinds of photos. It's very alive, very dynamic. 
Essentially, it's just everyday action, but it's also a little slice of life for us to digest, to experience. Same thing with this photo. It's documentation of everyday life in these disappearing communities. And again, this in large part is about recognizing the moment and then having the presence of mind to frame it all, to compose the image in a way that actually tells a story. Also this photo here, the little extra detail that I love here is the fog. Visual cues again. Because of the fog, this image is now communicating to us on a physiological level as well. Honestly, I do wish that you had more images like these ones. They're just as important and can be just as powerful as the portraits. And look, I am showing a couple of other ones, but this is the first bit of criticism that I have for you. There just doesn't seem to be quite the same enthusiasm behind them. And you'll see why this is relevant a little later on. Now, Valeri, let's get back to your email and to your questions. The impression that I have is that you're at least somewhat frustrated by the fact that your images are not being published in a book. Uh, it seems that the publishers have planted a seed of doubt in your mind. And I think that the question you're actually trying to ask is, does anybody need this work? And that's a question that many of us face, including myself. We often ask ourselves, does anybody care about what I create? And I have a couple of thoughts about this. On the one hand, looking at your work, you seem to really enjoy this. Like I said, seems like you're on a mission to capture this disappearing Bulgaria. Does a book make this work more legitimate for you? Does making it appeal to an international audience make it more legitimate? Would you stop if you knew that it probably wouldn't get published or get seen by a wider audience anytime soon? Now, on the other hand, I do understand that when you create this beautiful, deep body of work, very personal, you want to share it. You want to see it come to fruition as some sort of a final product, whether it's in a beautiful book or maybe in a gallery. Of course, that sort of stuff does encourage us and it makes us want to continue. And of course, we want our work that means something to us to be seen by as many people as possible. But here's the reality of things. Not all kinds of photographs have mass appeal. And even just the fact that you've chosen to present them in black and white, that's already putting you into a certain niche. And while, as I've already mentioned, I think this project is great, and other people interested in the region, in portraiture, in storytelling through photos, they might think it's great too, but the masses may not. Often the work that we love, that has value to us, just doesn't have the same value to the masses. And this applies not only to photography, it's in music and it's in film. And very recently, it's been confirmed to me yet again here on YouTube. I created two video diaries, very personal to me, really put my heart and soul into them. I thought that they had lots of cinematic merit. And of course, I was really excited about releasing them but lowest amount of views of all my videos. And it's not the first time that a personal project got less views. Will I stop making these kinds of videos? No, I make them for me. I create this sort of stuff because my soul needs it. And if there's even a small group of people that these projects resonate with, I personally look at that as a bonus. So I think that a big part of this is adjusting your own expectations and asking yourself, why do I create the kind of work that I create? And I'm not talking about the exception because every now and then you might create a personal project that's a breakout project and it resonates with the masses, but it's really too unpredictable to know, you know what will work and what won't on a large scale. So you have to ask, am I creating content for the masses to please the masses? Or am I creating content purely for myself? Or Am I trying to balance things out and create some content for the masses and some content purely for myself? And I think that for me, I am trying to find that balance with this YouTube channel. Now, having said all of that, I do have a couple of tips slash ideas that I think could make your project a little bit more complete and more well-rounded. Let's get back to photos like these that you're seeing now. I said before that I'd love to see more of them. And if you are trying to create a book, 
it only makes sense to add these sorts of images of everyday action of people doing things in these rural communities. So I'd try to add more of these kinds of photographs and put the same passion and energy into these types of photos that you put into your environmental portraits. Would adding these kinds of images get you closer to a book deal? I don't know, but you would be giving the publishers or the editors more to work with. And here's another idea. You say that these settlements, the houses where you photographed, they're becoming empty. Why not show this shed, the barn where this guy used to work, or a similar place, empty, eerie, clearly no one there for years? Or why not show some of the houses where you made your portraits years ago, now, abandoned, uncared for? Now, I think that this would add another layer to your project. It would show the passing of time. Now, I just really quickly want to share a little story with you. I remember very clearly when I was a child, I was holidaying in this particular town in this resort in the former USSR with my grandfather. I have very fond memories of the place. It was really flourishing at the time. And I remember that every morning I would go on the ninth floor of this hotel and I'd have a sandwich and a milkshake. So 25 years later, I came back to this place. My grandfather had passed away two years before then, and I was nostalgic. I wanted to relieve that moment. I thought that I would go to the ninth floor of the hotel, have my sandwich and the milkshake. Well, when I arrived, the whole place was not like I expected. It was in ruins, windows broken. This building looked like it had been through a war. This was what 25 years passing looked like. And if you can communicate that through your photography, I think that's going to be a very, very powerful thing. Going to wrap this one up, but before I do, I want to address your question about travel and photography in a post COVID-19 world. Should one travel to some far off isolated places to photograph what you are essentially photographing in your own backyard? And I think that you personally already know the answer to that one. But before I answer that, I think that we have to bring up the point that none of us actually know when we'll even be able to travel internationally again. But in your case, I think that you are sitting on a photographic gold mine. So if you're able to get access to shoot there soon, I suggest that you focus on that for now. Just maybe taking into consideration the couple of ideas that I've mentioned. So thank you again, Valeri, for sharing your work for raising the interesting questions. I hope to meet you one day when I come back to Bulgaria. All right, to finish this episode, we'll go to Bali and discuss a project by Franca Levin of Uruguay. She is Demente con Mochila on Instagram. I believe that means insane with a backpack. And dementeconmochila.com is her website. Franca's project is a relatively small one, but I believe that the situation was very interesting and something that some of us more intrepid travelers could very easily find ourselves in. I'll start with Franca's email. I'll summarize it. Franca was in Bali and one day she attended a cockfight. It was a very intense experience for her, but nevertheless, she photographed it, wrote about it, and the work was published in an online magazine. That's what she initially submitted to me, and you're seeing it now. Franca was limited in terms of gear. The place was pretty dark, and she only had the 18 to 55 lens, which came with her Nikon 5600. Franca asks, what would you have done better in my position? I couldn't move much from my spot, which made it very hard to get different angles. But there were many things to photograph, so I handled it. Do the photos transmit the atmosphere there? The dust, sweat, smell, the horror, the death, etc. I did read Franca's article and this opportunity came up pretty spontaneously. So like I said, this is a situation that many of us could find ourselves in. Something fascinating happens. We go quickly, not really prepared. Everything is a bit chaotic. In Franca's case, she only had the kit lens with her, which is really far from ideal if you want to photograph in low light and if you get, want to get closer to the action. Nevertheless, she went through with it. And well, I want to discuss what you did well, Franca, 
and what things you could have maybe done more of or better uh, to get the most out of this situation, even with the gear that you had. I also asked Franca to send me more images if she had any, so I'll quickly talk about some of those and I'll focus my attention on those cases where I think I can suggest something or on those photos which I think are particularly strong. So when you ask, did I manage to communicate the atmosphere? With a photo like this, I think you're definitely communicating it here. All these excited men, the smoke, the anxiety on their faces. I can just hear them cheering. So yeah, with some of the photos, I definitely feel like you've communicated the atmosphere. Some photos like this one communicated less. And then again, some like this one communicated more, even though this photo is not very straightforward. I think it works. Here's a man with his fighting cock. We can see the blade and the smoke is a great visual cue when you're talking about being able to smell the place. This image is okay. We get the point that there's money being exchanged, but it's definitely not the best off the photos where you show people with money. I think this one is much stronger. There's this nice gesture with this guy's outstretched arm with the money. And then also like them stretching out their arms, probably trying to get the attention of the bet takers. This is a very solid establishing shot. Definitely need an image like this to set the scene. And depending on how big we view it, we can actually see the traces of the violence, the carnage right here. And also we can just see these guys' faces, you know, quite interesting, quite a lot to look at in this photograph. This photo, I get the idea, it's also about the guys counting money, interacting, but uh, it's turned out to be more about their backs than anything else. So this isn't a great one. This one, yes, it's almost there. I love this detail, the money exchanging hands, but I'm not sure what setting you are on because usually when you're so close to something, the background gets blurred and here it's not that blurred. So maybe you close down the aperture. I would have liked to have seen the same image, but just with the background more separated from what we actually need to focus on. Okay, here I think I would have gone a bit more in this direction. But I'll later talk in more detail what I would have done differently even before the shoot. So the potential is here, but I think that there could have been much more. Okay, this image really works. The only thing is that I wish I could have seen a bit more of his face. Sort of turned more towards us. So if you see a character like this, just keep your camera pointed at them and try to capture various moments. You know, keep shooting. You want to increase your chances of getting the most dramatic moment. This one, not so crazy about because there's nothing really that suggests that this is a portrait of a fighting cock. Maybe if you photographed one after a fight or with some injuries, you would have been able to communicate that more effectively. This is pretty good, similar to what I referred to as the establishing shot, but I think the composition in that one is cleaner. This crowd shot is definitely not as strong as the first one, and there aren't really any gestures hinting of the action that's taking place. I would have really liked to have seen shots like these from different angles, you know, just to have this guy a little more to the side so that the composition is cleaner. Now, you were limited, but I'll get to my idea on what you could have possibly done. Oof, I really think you missed one here. I mean, I get what's happening. Maybe that's the guy there who won. This is the loser. But like this, there's just not enough impact. I wish you could have gone right in on this bird, which is, I think, I guess it's dead. You talk about the horror of this event, but as a viewer, I want proof, visual proof. I want something to just smash me across the head, you know? I think this one has some potential, but maybe the angle is a little off. Like, I do love what's happening here, how these guys are so intense, but I'd probably rather see what's happening here. You know, these guys, we can see that they're all focusing what's going on in that part of the ring, but I don't know if 
their expressions necessarily add as much to the image as seeing the action that's probably taking place here would have done. This one, I think you kind of are getting there. I mean, it would have been great if it was more clear what these birds are actually doing. If it was just a slightly different moment, I think that there's a lot of interesting stuff happening here, all the expressions and uh, all the attention focused on the two birds. This one, somewhat similar to the other ones, just not an ideal angle. This is a pretty good spectator image. I love how these guys are counting their money. Uh, these guys are looking off, I guess, into what's happening. So this works, but you do have those better photos with money and with the people cheering. And this here is another photo with potential, I think. Maybe you should have asked him to pause for a second. I know there were limitations, but there are some things which I think are just worth trying. Yes, good one here. The weapon, the blurred background that separates what we're meant to focus on from the rest of the frame. And this here definitely works. We see these cocks in action. I might have tried a few slower shutter speed photos. Just imagine if we had some nice motion blur that's suggestive of the movement that's taking place. You know what I also would have tried? I would have gotten closer to those feathers and the blood during a break, of course, to show this violence, the goriness, in a less direct, yet still, I think, a very powerful and impactful way. So a few very solid photos there, but now let's get to the idea that I mentioned about what you could have done to get more out of the situation. When you are photographing in a scenario like this, the most important thing is access. Now, I know you said it was forbidden for you to be there, you weren't meant to be there, but you were, and nobody kicked you out, and they obviously noticed you. You write later about your experience of men touching you on your way, and that's obviously as far from pleasant as one can think of. But then you say that some spiritual leader came and everybody kind of relaxed, and that's the first way in which you can try to gain access in a situation like this. You try to get a respected local person to collaborate with you. Now, you do run the risk of that person just maybe telling you to go to hell and ending up with no photos at all, but I do think that the risk is worth it. At the end, it all depends on what you want to get out of the experience. Look, because as it was, photographically, you were about, I don't know, halfway into it. Considering the circumstances and the technical limitations, I do think you did quite well. You did communicate some of what you wanted to communicate through the photos, and you later wrote in another email that the words are as important as the photos for you. But imagine if these photos were stronger. Again, it comes down to what is your ultimate aim? Is it to create a few photos for a blog post or for a relatively small publication? If that's the case, then what you have is absolutely fine, sufficient. However, if you want to go further with your photography, I would try to get better access. Maybe it's not the spiritual person, maybe it's somebody else, but I would try to exhaust all the different opportunities before I say, okay, this is it, this is what I have, and, and I'm just gonna shoot within these limitations. Now, would it be a positive, fun experience to shoot this? Of course not, not in this case. It could be a total pain in the ass to get that access. So you really have to ask yourself, how much do I really want to be documenting this? I just wanted to come back to this photo and this one real quick. I think another thing you could have tried is to make some more portraits of these men with their uh, cocks. Having been to Bali and many places in Indonesia, I'm pretty sure that these guys would have been flattered by a foreign woman taking interest in them and the hobby which they love. Could it be weird and uncomfortable? Absolutely, but that's often the case with these more edgy kinds of subjects. I remember when I photographed these sulfur miners in Indonesia. All they were doing during the first few days is making fun of me, and then they got over it. We kind of adapted to each other. I even became friends with some of them, and I got what I consider are some strong images. And that's ultimately why we take the risks up to a point, it's what we make ourselves uncomfortable for, for the photo. 
that's it for Franca's portfolio. Thank you very much, Franca, for participating. A project and an approach which is very different to the other two participants, but something that we can all learn from as well. So this is the end of the first episode. I hope that everybody who watched got something out of it. I'm really curious to know what you think. So if you have any thoughts or questions in the comments below, stay tuned for the next episode with new different portfolios, new discussions, critiques, ideas, and new things for everybody to learn.